Yeah. Okay, so I think, I think we'll probably start now because we might have to finish a bit early. So this is Scott Morrison, if you don't already know. He'll be talking about um, quantum mechanics without all the physics. Thank yeah. you, Scott. Uh, thanks very much, guys, for uh, the opportunity to, to give this talk. And, um, I've been wanting to give a talk like this for quite a while, but I've uh, never really had the right opportunity to do it. Um, there's not really any uh, sort of really advanced mathematics going on here. Um, so I couldn't give this talk as a talk to, to grown-up mathematicians at a conference or something that think I was just talking about, about elementary basic stuff. But it's also this story that just, uh, that just doesn't get told very often, which is sort of the mathematician's perspective on how you should think about quantum mechanics. Um, some of you, I'm not presuming all of you, have seen some quantum mechanics over in the physics department, and they will have told you all sorts of rubbish. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and it's useful and lets you do calculations and so on, um, but there are better ways to think about it. And unfortunately, this better perspective that, that exists and is, is available uh, is traditionally only told to people after they've gone through a long and painful initiation in mathematics. Typically, you have to have learned what a von Neumann algebra is and know what a Banach space is and all of this crazy stuff that doesn't happen even in undergraduate courses until someone explains this story to you. Uh, but it, not, it doesn't have to be like that. And you can tell this story at a very elementary level, just talking about two by two matrices. Some four by four matrices will turn up at the very end of the talk. Uh, and uh, so I want to try doing this story. I've never given this talk before or anything quite like it, so it may end up a complete disaster. Hang on to your hats and we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, so um, I said that I'm going to tell you everything about quantum mechanics in this lecture, and obviously that's rubbish. What I'm going to do is tell you uh, everything about quantum probability, which is sort of like the, the basic operating system, the, the, the fundamental logical language that quantum mechanics is really uh, meant to be said in. And it's uh, it's sort of closely, closely related to classical probability. And we'll, we'll see as we go through this story that classical and quantum probability are just going to fall out as two aspects of the same more, more general thing. So, uh, well, we're going to start right at the beginning with some sort of metaphysics and, and uh, set up everything as we go along, derive everything really from first principles. So we're going to be thinking about some physical system uh, I don't know, maybe some boring physical object like an electron or this pen, or maybe something complicated like a, a human sitting in a chair at the, at the front of the lecture. And we're going to start thinking about this physical system. Well, maybe this system has, uh, has some set of states, the, the states the system can be in. And we'll come to that. That's sort of going to be secondary in this story. What we're really going to think about is that for this system that we're thinking about, there's some set of observables. So we're going to write all through this lecture the letter A for the set of observables of this system. So an observable um, is different from an observation. An observable is just something that we might go and observe if we wanted to. It's something we could go and measure about the system if, if we wanted to. And now there's going to be a sort of a pairing between observables and states. If I've got an observable I want to measure and the system is in some particular state, we can go ahead and measure them and we'll typically get some number. So these observables are things we might measure about the system that produce a number. Like, how tall are you in centimeters? Or, how many courses are you enrolled in this semester? Okay? Those are observables of a, of a human. Maybe. But we're really going to prioritize the observables and think about the algebraic structure of these guys. So this is the big question for the first half of the talk. What is the natural algebraic structure on the set of observables? Now, as I said before, for simplicity, uh, let's assume uh, our observables uh, produce real numbers. Uh, when measured. Okay. So let me erase the states for now. We're not going to get to think about them for quite a while. Uh, and let's start thinking about what we can do with observables. I want to start defining some algebraic operations on this thing, which at the moment is just some bare set. So first of all, uh, given two observables, <coughs> say x and y, I can measure x 
oops, measure x, then measure y, but I measure them and I don't say out loud the, the answers I get as I do those two individual measurements. I just measure them and report the product of the, of the results. Okay? So this is a new thing that I could do to my system. Okay? And we define uh, xy to be a new observable uh, by this, by this operation. Okay? We're defining a new observable. Do two observations in sequence, and only report the product of the two answers. Now, sometimes this can produce kind of silly results. Uh, if you're driving around in country New South Wales, and you arrive in a town of Nil Desperado, population 13, altitude 46 meters, you're welcome to report that this town has, I don't know how many, 1,002 people meters. That's fine. <laughs> um, we just wanted to find a product on any two observables. Okay. Now, as soon as we've got this notion of multiplication of two observables, uh, well, I think maybe let me say one thing about this. Uh, there's no reason why xy should equal yx. Okay? We're not going to insist that this is the case, that you measure y first and then x, and then they report the product of the results, or measure x first and then y, and then report the product of the results. Those don't need to be the same thing. Maybe because doing this first operation might change the system in some way. I mean, if I ask you, do you like this cupcake? Answer zero, if no, one, if yes. And then I ask, how much do you weigh? Well, we'll I'll get different results. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's no, no demand that, that this product is, a, is, is community. Okay, now there are also boring observations. I'm sorry, boring observables. Like the observable one or seven, which doesn't even look at the system, it just reports the number. The observable seven doesn't look at the system, it just always says seven. Okay? I'm going to declare that to be a, an observable. And of course, now that I've got these boring observables, I've got a notion of scalar multiplication of one observable by, by a number. Okay? If x is an observable, so is seven times x. Okay, it just reports seven times whatever the underlying observable x would have said. So we do our boring observables too? What's that? Uh, can we say that our boring observables would commute? Yeah, so the boring observables definitely commute just because the real numbers, <coughs> multiplication of real numbers commutes. And indeed they commute with everything else because, because the boring observables don't even look at the system, they couldn't possibly change it. So seven times x actually must be the same as x times seven. Okay, okay so you can see what we're going to keep doing for the next little while, we're going to keep defining new bits of algebraic structure on our set of observables, like this first one of defining multiplication of observables. You already look unhappy back there. <laughs> no, okay. If you're unhappy, shout, because, uh, yeah, there's probably good reasons to be unhappy about some of what I said. Okay. Um, you should also think about, uh, so here's an exercise, why is x, y, then times z, equal to x times y times z. Okay? And this, I claim that this is something that sort of is just automatically true from the way that we set things up. Okay, now we need to get to the slightly harder stuff. So, given observables x and y, I'm going to next define, well, I'm going to next define the sum of two observables. I'm going to define x plus y. And you might think that what I should do is follow the same recipe as multiplication, which is that you should measure x, then you should measure y, and then you should report the sum of the two answers. And you could conceivably try doing that, but it would be a bad idea, and things would go horribly wrong. Uh, we're going to do something better that gives us a better defined addition operation on our set that's going to, that's going to be much more pleasant. So I'm not going to define x plus y first. Uh, we'll first define the average. We'll define x plus y over 2. And more generally, we'll define a, uh, a convex linear combination. So that is a sum of alpha i times xi, where the coefficients alpha i uh, sum up to 1. So this is what's called a convex linear combination of things. But x plus y over 2 in particular is an example where both of the alphas are one another. Okay. 
And I'll just tell you how to do this, and you'll see how to do the more general case for yourself. So here's the recipe for x plus y. The recipe is flip a coin. I assume you have access to a fair coin certified by the, uh, the Royal Bank of Australia. Uh, if it's heads, measure and report x. If it's tails, uh, measure and report y. Okay, but don't tell me what, what came up, what, what, what side of that coin came up. Don't tell me whether it, hit, whether it was heads or tail. Do that privately. And the result of the observation is just reporting either x or y. Okay. So that's going to be my definition. I mean, now defining what x plus y over 2 means is a new observable on this set to form this little, this little, uh, this little sequence of things. Uh, and you can imagine how I define more generally a convex linear combination. You're meant to choose an element from this index set randomly with weights given by the alpha rise, maybe by rolling a die or something else. There's six options and you've six weights. Okay, and then once you've got this, uh, let's define uh, x plus y to be 2 times x plus y over 2. So just take this averaging operation and then do scalar multiplication by 2. And an exercise is that this is the same as doing this, as doubling both x and y first and then averaging. Yeah. So I don't quite understand. Yeah, yeah. Like, have you actually said what x plus y over 2 is yet? Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so sorry. This is the definition here. So this, is, this box here is the definition of x plus y over 2. But it might be different values. Yeah, you can, I mean, all of this is, it's a, it's a recipe that we can walk up to our system, perform this recipe, and produce a number at the end. And that's all we need to do to count as an, to count as an observable. Okay? It, there's, no, there's no necessity that these observables are kind of consistent or anything else. There's, it's just a recipe for walking up the system, performing some operation, getting a number out of it. Okay, that's all I need. Okay, now some further exercises. Uh, x plus y equals y plus x. It's important here that you didn't tell me whether you got heads or tails when you did this recipe, so I don't know which one you actually went and observed. And this fact just comes from the from the fact that, well, which side of a coin is heads and which side of the coin is tails is really just a matter of convention. These are operationally the same things. Uh, and actually somewhat more difficult and rather confusing, and I'm happy to talk about it afterwards, but I'm going to hide it under the rug for now, uh, is that addition is associated with 2. And if you're upset and disturbed by that one when you think about it in detail, don't worry, come and talk to me, and we can, we can work that one. Okay, oh, oh, and the final one, the final exercise, is that this bizarre no notion of the, of the sum of two observables works well with our notion of multiplication. That is, x times y plus z really is the same thing as x times y plus x times z. Okay, that is, multiplication distributes out over addition. Okay, so I claim that whatever system you're looking at, whether it's classical or quantum or somewhere in between or something else, the set of observables has, has this structure of addition and multiplication that fit together in a nice way. So the answer now is this, that the set of observables, A naturally, has the structure what's called an associative algebra. Now, uh, an associative algebra is just something that's a vector space that's also got a notion of multiplication on it. Okay, you can take two things in the vector space and you can multiply them with another element of the vector space. And everything plays nicely. Uh, the, the, this is the same that the multiplication is associative and then these are other things that you want to be true in an associative algebra. Okay. So, We've said all of this abstract nonsense metaphysics uh, and tried to justify why we should want our observables to form an algorithm. Let's give just one or two examples now before we go on to talking about states as well. Okay, so 
a very simple example of an algebra is just A is uh, the complex valued function, it's on some set. And here, we're just going to define the operations pointwise. So you can take two functions, you can add them pointwise, or you can take two functions, you can multiply them pointwise. Okay, so maybe sort of a, to be really, really concrete, uh, you can just take C2, that's pairs of complex numbers, Z and W. So here, C2, you can think of it as functions from the two elements set to the complex numbers. It's just a pair of complex numbers. And the rule, of course, is just that sort of ZW plus XY Z plus X, W plus Y is similar to multiplication. Okay? So this is a, going to be, this is one of the two kind of examples of algebras that you should have in mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, do you mean uh, functions with complex coefficients or? Yeah, I just mean co complex co uh, complex values. Yeah. So, so C two here is is functions from the two element set to the complex numbers. It's a pair of complex numbers. Okay, I think okay. so. It's just uh, we can consider it's just the uh, fu functional extension of it. Sorry. Uh, it's just extend extend the say by function. It's a C uh, square. Bracket, oh no 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 no! It's simpler than that. It really it's just the, the sort of the complex plane. It's, it's literally just a pair of complex numbers. Okay. I said, maybe I've said this in a confusing way by still talking about complex valued functions on X. So here, what we're really saying is that C two is uh, functions from the set uh, one comma two to the complex numbers. Oops. So you can represent such a function as a pair of complex numbers, the value of the function on the, on the element 1 and the value of the function on the element 2. Sorry, maybe, maybe I've said this unnecessarily abstractly. I shouldn't have said this and just said this guy is an algebra. Pairs of complex numbers form an algebra with pointwise operations. Okay. And now this is going to be the, the fundamental example of an algebra of observables that's going to give us classical probability in a moment. Well, well you know, a few moments maybe. Okay. And let's give one more example, which will be the fundamental example that gives us quantum probability. We could take instead a <coughs> to be two by two complex matrices. W, X, Y, Z, complex numbers. Okay with usual matrix addition and multiplication. Okay. Now, unlike in this case, unlike in the classical case, the addition here was certainly not commutative. When you multiply matrices, it matters what order you multiply them in. You can get different answers. This was not the case back over here when you're looking at C2 with pointwise multiplication, certainly the multiplication is commutative. So there's some fundamental difference between the two. And that fundamental difference, whether the algebra is commutative or not, whether the multiplication is commutative or not, is precisely the difference between the classical and quantum worlds, as we'll see. Okay, we'll definitely come back to these examples uh, as we proceed further on. Okay, um, questions? Yeah, Rob. Uh, well, I'm going to say yes. So this algebra certainly had an identity. I, maybe I should have said it. The observation that doesn't look at the system and always reports the number one is a is a is a is a unit for the multiplication. Um, and actually, since Robert, you've just asked a question, um, I should point out that uh, maybe you could try doing all of the formalism that I'm doing today. Um, without demanding that you can have real valued observations, and maybe we sh you should think about how much of this works if you just have a semi-ring instead of an algebra. Okay, so we'll return to, to this. Okay, so the 
Okay, so we, it's now time to start talking about, about states of the system. We've talked a lot about observables. Why do we have an algebra as opposed to a ring? Why do we have an algebra as opposed to a ring? Merely because I said that uh, amongst the observables, I want to allow uh, not looking at the system and reporting any real number. And that lets me multiply by any real number. Okay, so that means that whatever we got here was a real algebra. Yeah. Okay? I mean, a ring, an, an algebra is nothing more or less than a ring which contains a copy of the, of the, of, of the field that you, that you intend to work over. Okay. So it's just because I insisted that those constant observations were allowed. Okay. Okay, states. Now, usually, sort of classically thinking about the world, you might think that you might want to think about observations as being some function on a set of states. The system can be in some set of states, and a particular observation is a function on it. Like if I'm if, if my observation is is how tall are you, and I'm talking to a person, and that person can be one of the people in this room, how tall are you is a function on the set of the people the set of people in this room, okay? But we don't want to think that way. We want to turn everything upside down. And we instead want to think of states as being functions on the observables. So that is, given a state, for any given question we can ask about the state, we're going to return the answer. And that's the sense in which a state is a function on the, all the possible observables. For each observable, we can look at what, an, what answer we get by measuring that observable. So states uh, are functions on observables. And turning things upside down like that is uh, is going to be what makes us what allows us to see something beyond the, the classical world. Okay, so let's just give a definition and then go through and try and justify a little bit. So a state on A, that's our associative algebra of observables, is uh, A linear function, I'll nearly always call my states rho in this, uh, 